Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ray. I'm an alcoholic, a member of the Miami Men's Group in Miami, Florida, a group of discontented misogynists who rattle around down there. And uh, I'm supposed to be talking three hours on primary purpose. Well, forget it. <laughs> three hours. But I've got to talk. First, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, something that I like to talk about particularly, and it's the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and it's, it's a, a history you don't hear very much about. It's a history that doesn't begin in Akron, Ohio. In fact, it ends in Akron, Ohio. And I think that it's a true story. It's a good AA story. And, and like all true good AA stories, it has a moral to it, which is consistent with uh, our primary purpose about which I will speak probably a great length in a little while. I also brought over where Al is a, something I wrote all 10 or 11, maybe 12 years ago on this subject, and I brought some copies, and you can have them, and you can uh, copy them and do anything you want with it. All of this is covered in, in my six-volume work, hum- Humility and Beyond. <laughs> Humility and Beyond has has been a great, great seller, and uh, this is all covered there. Now, anyhow, I want to talk to you about this history because I think it's important, and I sure do like the way I tell it. (laughs) Now, I don't know where where AA had its origins. I don't know where a spiritual force, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, where it begins. I don't know. Movements such as ours, which are spiritual, usually have their origins uh, in the mind of God somewhere. And that's a difficult place to locate. Well, I'll tell you when it began to become evident to me, I discovered this. In, around before the First World War, in the 1910s or so, a cast of characters began to assemble in a little town in Vermont, Manchester, Vermont. Manchester, Vermont is a very beautiful place. It's in the southern portion of Vermont. It's at that point of the state of Vermont where the states of Massachusetts, New York, and Vermont all come together. It's a resort town. Uh, it's got a golf course. It's got a big hotel. It's even got a little mountain, the Equinox Mountain. It's got a lake. It's a really a nice place. And... Uh, down from East Dorset, Vermont, which is about 12 miles up Route 7, which used to be the main north-south route before the interstate. Down from there came this Bill Wilson. He went to come to the prep school. There was a prep school in Manchester. I think it's still there, the Manchester Academy. Came down with his violin, his boomerang, and his baseball glove. And he enrolled in the prep school. And then over from Albany, New York, which is only about... 30 miles to the west of the capital of New York State, came a, another young man named Ebby uh, Thatcher, whose family were very prominent uh, accountants. They were CPAs in Albany, and they had this beautiful home right on the main, main street of of, of uh, Manchester, Vermont. And then up from Brooklyn, New York, came this physician, Dr. Burnham, with his lovely daughter, Lois, about whom we all know. And then from New York City by way of Newport, Rhode Island, came a very, very rich young man named Roland Hazard, whose family had a farm about 20 miles outside of Manchester. And these young people, all in their teens, who had no possible idea of what the future was going to hold for them or us, began to mix, as do young people everywhere. And uh, and they they had all of the social lives that you and I had at that age, and then the war came, the big war. Uh, Bill, uh, of course, tells us in our book that he was off to the Army. Bill had graduated Norwich University, which is a, a small 
college up in Northfield, Vermont, and it's uh, got a big ROTC presence, and he was part of that. And he had a, a second lieutenant commission in the Vermont National Guard, which was a field artillery unit. And so he was off, as our book says, to Westminster Cathedral and then to France for the war. And the rest of them dispersed. When the war was over in 1919, 1920, they reassembled in Manchester, Vermont, this crowd. And uh, they enjoyed the, the company of one another again. And uh, you all know Bill ended up marrying Lois and uh, went back to live in Brooklyn. He went back to... Uh, he got a job with an insurance company, and he went to law school at night. And he got about his life, which included a lot of drinking, and so did the rest of them. The first one to get in serious trouble with the booze was the rich kid, Roland Hazard. And Roland came up a really unmanageable alcoholic, and his family did everything they could to, to uh, help him. They brought him to all of these sanitaria. Uh, you know, this, this is not a new problem. This problem has gone on forever and ever. There's always been places for rich people to go dry out. And so they sent Roland all around, but it, you know, it didn't work. So they finally sent him in desperation to the greatest psychiatrist of the time, Carl Jung, the colleague of Sigmund Freud, who had his own hospital in Switzerland. And Roland has it went over there and stayed a whole year with uh, Jung. And uh, he was pronounced and certified and all the rest of it. And he was sent home. And he started back and he got as far as Paris. When someone asked him the wrong question. <laughs> Somebody said to Roland, would you like a drink? Uh, the only time I said no to that question, I completely misunderstood the question. <laughs> so Roland had a drink. In fact, he had more than several. And uh, he went back to Young. He said, look at this. Look. I said, well, you would have, you would have done it, I would have done it. He said, I'm a whole year with you. And all that money, all that time, and now I'm just, just as bad as ever I was. And Young didn't really appreciate the fact that, uh, Roland Hazard was an alcoholic. And he said to him, I have never seen an alcoholic of your type recover. Never. You're gonna die from this thing. And of course, when you get, you got news given to you like that, Roland immediately said, is there no possible way out? And Young said, yeah, there is. Here and there, now and then, once in a while, very, very rare. It's a phenomena. It's not repeatable. It's not science. People like you have a religious experience. And that takes care of it. They have a transference of religion into takes care of their alcohol. But apart from that, you're a dead duck. And you're finished. And forget about it. Well, it's nice to have money. <laughs> because Roland went out to buy himself a spiritual experience. And he found for sale the Oxford Group. And uh, he took the Oxford Group, a bunch of them, and now this is in, we're in the 1930s now. He took a bunch of these people to Manchester, Vermont. And he turned his father's gentleman's farm into a commune for the Oxford people. And they had 25, 30 people. This is the middle of the Great Depression in, uh, in the United States. Everybody's wiped out. And he's feeding them and he's got all the money. He's got dough. And he, they got a free ride and they they live together. They do all of the Oxford stuff together. And they're up there in Manchester, Vermont. The next one who got into trouble was Evie Thatcher. Evie's family exiled him from Albany, New York. And they sent him out of town. He was an embarrassment. They made him go live in the summer house over in Manchester, Vermont. I, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Albany, New York. <laughs> but being exiled from Albany, New York is like <laughs> being exiled from Newport News, you know. <laughs> A Navy veteran speaks, speaks to you. <laughs> uh, the first thing Abby did to cause a, you know, pep things up a bit was come around the corner and into a farmer's kitchen in his car. Very tricky corners in Vermont. And, uh, and he stepped out of the car and asked if anybody had a drink. Well, Vermonters are not notorious for their humor. 
and neither was this guy. So they got the cops, and they had him in front of the local judge, and the local judge gave him the speech. I used to be a judge. I gave the speech many times. You know, if I ever see you again, he went through the whole thing on. So Abby got out of that, and he did. He had some fit of alcoholic remorse, you know, that thing that we used to get, oh, dear. So in order to square things, he decided he would paint the family house. Now, we're talking about one of these Victorian things with the spires and the towers, and they're very big. It's right on the main street of uh, Manchester, Vermont. Now, he knows nothing of painting, but he's alcoholic, so he doesn't have to know anything about painting. <laughs> uh, so he goes out and he buys some paint, and he buys a brush, and he gets a ladder, and he gets, you know. The trouble is he could only get up to the second rung of the ladder. He kept falling off the ladders. <laughs> but he did get a little spot painted, and then he did what we all wanted, would do. He got a beach chair and a quart of booze, and he decided to sit down and sort of watch his paint, you know, make sure it's bask in the glory of and while he was doing that, a pigeon had the temerity to take a shit upon the paint, <laughs> which so enraged Evie that he went into the house and came back out with a shotgun. Now you have a lunatic drunk with a shotgun shooting at pigeons on the main street of Manchester, Vermont. <laughs> and here's Evie back in front of the same judge. <laughs> and the judge is prepared to to, you know, throw the book, as we say. But it is the United States of America. He does have certain rights, and they give him a phone call. Well, who would you call? He called his rich friend, Roland, up at the farm. He says, I'm in trouble with... And down came Roland with two other guys from the farm. And Roland said to the judge, we'll take him. You don't have to put him away. We'll take him. We'll take care of him. And they did. They got Ebby, and they bring him back up. And now Ebby's up at the farm with Roland, and the both of them are not drinking. And we're into around October of 34. It's cold in, in Vermont. I went to college up there. And, uh, on Columbus Day, it starts to turn. It gets a little cold. And so, Roland, when you're rich, you don't have to be cold. He said, let's go back to New York where he had the big place. And uh, so he and Abby come down to New York. Now, this is in the Depression, 34. And in the Depression in this country, there was a thing called soup kitchen. They're all over the place. And they were free food. And a lot of people needed free food. I'm not talking about alcoholics or pathological people, just people. Ordinary people who didn't have food. And you went through the soup kitchen, you got soup, you got a sandwich, you got an apple in most of them. I remember. And uh, the Calvary Church, which is an Episcopal church, Dr. Shoemaker, and the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the 30s, if you go there this very day, you'll see the main window is a, a gift of the Hazard family. They contributed to the church. And they maintained the soup kitchen. And uh, so Bill, uh, every rather, Thatcher and Roland Hazard were on the soup kitchen, handing out the soup to the people coming through. Part of the Oxford group, part of their spiritual life. And uh, Ebby testifies. Ebby says the thought came to him, and he doesn't know where it came from. I should call my friend Bill Wilson. Where he doesn't he said it just buzzed into his head. One day he's with the soup. So he called Bill Wilson. Bill says the phone rang, I picked it up, he said it was my friend. And he said he wanted to come visit me and I said, Come right out. And then he went out to Brooklyn, it's a half hour from where he was. And uh he rings the bell and Bill says, This is terrific because Bill has three quarts of bathtub gin. In those days they used to make it in the bathtub. They clean out the bathtub, fill it up with, with the water and the still spirits. Some juniper berries, stir it around, and that was called gin. And Bill had three quarts of it. He said he had hidden it all around the house, and he had just one more pot. He wanted to hide one more bottle to get through the night. But he knew he could get drunk that day and one more day. He says that in our book. And the doorbell rings. He opens the bell, and there's Abby. And Bill says he would look forward to this. He said they were going to talk about the old days, you know, what you and I would do. If some bum showed up that we used to drink with, right? Talk about the good old days. He said, about, Bill says in our book about the chartered flight. Bill Wilson and Evie Thatcher were the first people to land at the Manchester Vermont Airport. The reason they were the first ones to land at the Manchester Vermont Airport is they landed the day before it opened. <laughs> they made a small error and about the timing, and they were very drunk. 
and they rolled off the plane, and the local high school band was rehearsing for the next day's opening, and, and these two thought it was for them. And they came off the plane, my fellow Americans, you know. And Bill thought this is what he would do with Abby. He would sit in the kitchen, you know, they'd have a drink, remember the time we did this, remember the time we did that, all that great stuff. So they go into the kitchen, Bill pulls out the gin, and he takes another look at Abby. And he says, you know, well, something happened to the old boy. And he said to him, he says, you know, well, come now. He says, what happened to you? And then he said, I got religion. And Bill said, oh, God. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. This summer, a religious crackpot. Oh, well, more gin for me. <laughs> now, Ebby is full of the Oxford group. You remember when you and I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that first surge of spiritual power that came into our lives. We were full of AA. We were going to call up our cousin Charlie. Stop drinking, Charlie. <laughs> we're going to, you know, get out there and, by God, make a difference. <laughs> Until we develop into, wow, wow, well, who gives a shit? <laughs> and this is Emmy. He's full of it. And he, Bill says, he starts at Bill. Bill, I want to hear it. Please, you know, Bill had gone to school. He liked scientists. His degree in uh, his college degree was in electrical engineering. You know that. So he was that kind of a, had that kind of a mind, and they didn't want to hear about all this business about the Oxford group. But then Abby said the thing that really got Bill's attention, and he said it so it got his attention so much that they italicized it in the book. They underlined it, and he said to Bill, "You can form your own concept of God." With us, with the Oxford group. It's God as you understand it. Bill had never heard that. Bill was Episcopalian. You know, God's frozen people. Uh, <laughs> you can't form your own concept of God if you're an Episcopalian or a Catholic or anybody else. You take this. They got it already before you showed up. They got one. Here it is. This is our God. But, and it got Bill's attention. He said, this is, this is a wonderful thing. He did not stop drinking. He did not stop drinking. He went to town hospitals a couple more times. He had a terrific bout on uh, Veterans Day, November 11, 1934. And then finally, his sobriety day is December the 11th, 1934. And on December the 11th, he buys three bottles of beer, does Bill, and goes up to Towns Hospital. Now, the grapevine a couple of years ago, or more, more than a couple of years, I guess, uh, reprinted a picture, a photostat, or printing, or whatever the hell you call it, of Bill's admission form in Towns Hospital. He said he'd been there eight times before. And that the bill had been paid by his brother-in-law, $125, by Lois's brother, who was a osteopathic physician. And uh, it had all his, you know, his height, his weight, his blood pressure, all that stuff, stuff his hospital chart. Bill says he got into the hospital and Ebby came to see him. That was the first thing. He called up Ebby. And Ebby says, my schoolmate visited me. I want to make sure I have, uh, I don't like to, to uh, quote the book unless I have it, because I don't want to misquote the book. I got Sammy's book here, which is well used. And he says about the hospital, my schoolmate visited me. I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. We made a list of the people I had hurt and toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. My friend promised me that when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. Now notice, uh, see, I have an attitude about AA. That's a, a, a gross understatement. And I have opinions 
and I don't necessarily want to inflict my opinions on you because we don't share opinions, we share experience. Well, my sobriety date is November 24, 1965. And I said to my sponsor, how many of those meetings with those people do I have to go to? He said, yeah, we thought about you. Seven a week will do. <laughs> so I don't know, pushed me around. I went to nine, and, uh, and now I go to eight. So I've been on a lot of AA meetings. So my opinions are based on experience. <laughs> and here is here is one of my basic opinions. Alcoholics Anonymous does not have to do with alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous has to do with establishing a relationship with God. That is one of my basic things. And don't tell me you don't believe in God, because I don't give a goddamn what you believe in. <laughs> Believing in God has nothing to do with it. I got some fool now that I sponsor. He don't want to say the third step prayer. He says he's an atheist. I said, you can be an atheist. I don't care. No one cares what you believe, you moron. You probably believe the world is flat. I'm not telling you what to believe. I said, I'm telling you what to do. You will say the third step prayer. Well, I'm going to have a drunken atheist on my hands and I can't handle it. Now listen to what Abby told Bill. Wouldn't you think, if you had a friend like Bill, that's drinking his out of control, wouldn't you say to Bill, listen, you'll stop drinking? Wouldn't you say that to him? You're going to be able to stop drinking, Bill. You'll finally get that monkey off your back. You're going to be okay. You're not going to have to sit up online and drink that crap gin. You're not going to have to move your bed down the floor so you don't jump out the window. Abby didn't say that to Bill at all. He said, you will enter with a new relationship with your creator. You will have the elements of a way of living which will answer all your problems. That's what he told them. And that's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, the spiritual awakening. Drinking is just a symptom of what's the matter with me. Drinking was never my problem. It was never your problem either. Did someone have to teach you how to drink? You have to say, where do I stand? <laughs> how do I hold this, you know? Please. Please. Now, Ebby goes. Ebby leaves. It's all over. Bill now feels the way you and I felt that day before we came in. Remember that? You'll never forget it, will you? Huh? When Bill, Bill says of himself, quicksand spread in all directions. You remember that? You knew you'd gone too far. That was all over. And, you know, you know that, that thing... Let me explain this to you. Like, uh, you'll understand this. I know you will. It comes at 4 o'clock in the morning. Remember it? And it comes into the room. And it wakes you up. And your body says, I need a drink. And it's 4 o'clock in the morning. And you may be in bed with someone, but you're all alone. And the bullshit is all over. And the bombast and the bravado and all that stuff is all finished. And you know it's got you. By the throat, and there's not a goddamn thing in the world that you can do about it. Now you can get up and have a couple of drinks, but it's very tricky because you gotta get up at seven and go to work anyhow. So you gotta work chemistry. You know, if I have three, if I can take, if I finish this bottle like I want to, then you know. And the Irish call that the creature. I don't know why, the creature. And the creature has you. Get you better. Yeah. And that's what happened to Bill. Bill gets in the, the little hospital bed there. Birdie's hospital bed. And the creature's got him. And he can't, he can't sit, he can't lie still, he can't turn, he can't. So he ends up on his knees on the floor. And Bill says, if, if there is a God, let him show himself now. And Bill reports that the room lit up with a light so intensive that he no longer could see the wall. And that in his mind's eye, he was transported to another dimension and a wind blew through that room. And he said to himself, so, this is the God of the preachers, this thing I've heard about. Now it subsided, of course, and he sent for Silkworth, the great Silkworth came 
And Bill said, Bill's an experienced alcoholism patient his eighth time. He says in the book, I was on the verge of the DTs. And he knew it. And he said to Silkwhite, what do you think? And Silkwhite said, well, I don't know. I wasn't here. You know, I'm a scientist. I wasn't here. But you look a lot better now than you did a few hours ago. So whatever happens, you you better use it. And Bill did. And, and Bill got out of there. And he went down to the soup kitchen with Evie and Roland. So now there's three of them handing out the soup. And Bill was trying to sell his story to the people coming through the line, some of whom are out, alcoholics. And also, in every neighborhood in New York, there's a bar in every corner. So he's going through the bars around there in the 30s. And he's trying to interest people in the fact that his room lit up. <laughs> See, in New York City has a people, I'm from New York, I was born in, in New York City, I grew up, I was born in the Bronx, I grew up there, blah, blah, blah. People like me from New York have a certain attitude. And it does not include somebody coming into a bar, asking someone to tell me about his room lighting up, you know what I'm saying? The New York response to that is, yeah, light this one up, Charlie, you know. <laughs> Jump up here and take a light, I'll show you something. So he went back up to Silkwood. He said, I'm going into these people. Well, imagine if, if, if all of that had happened to you, if God had showed up in your hospital room. My God, you know. And Bill said, and yeah, he said to Silkwood, nobody wants to pay any attention to him. And Silkwood said, that's not the message. You got the wrong message. The right message is the same message that Young gave to Roland. You're going to die. That gets their attention. Tell them. Emphasizes to took away the fatal nature of this disease. Now he has to go to Akron, Ohio. Now we're getting to Akron, Ohio. Now he goes to Akron, Ohio. You all know the story. It's Mother's Day weekend of 1935. Everybody goes back to New York, his crowd, for the Mother's Day. He's got ten bucks. He can't afford to go back. He's in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel. And he's thinking about having a drink. In a gay bar. It says he could hear that gay crowd inside. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> now, here's a guy, here's an alcoholic who had God in his room in November, December. He had God, Almighty God, in his room in December, and he wants to go into a bar in May. This shows you God is good for, what, six months? <laughs> but he doesn't do that. He makes a series of phone calls, and he ends up with Henrietta Cyberling. And here's where it really gets interesting. Really gets interesting. I'm a lawyer, and I used to try cases. And this is the proof. This is it. This is the one you can sell right to anybody. Henrietta Cyberling is the estranged daughter of Frank Cyberling, Jr. Frank Cyberling, Sr. is the chairman of the board of Goodyear Rubber. Just recently, I saw her on cable TV, Castles of America, and there was a Cybeling Castle. What an enormous thing it is. And Henrietta's living in the gatehouse because her husband, Frankie Jr., is a boozer and a bum, and she can't play with him. And every, the whole family knows it, so they give her the gatehouse. She's a member of the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group of Akron, Ohio, had a practice, and the practice was, had many practices, but one of the practices was, on the first meeting of the month, any member of the group could stand up and talk about a problem, much the same we do in our, in our meetings. You know, anybody got a problem, that kind of thing? So the first meeting in May, Dr. Robert Smith, local proctologist, we dress him up, we call him a surgeon. He was a proctologist. Not a bad speciality. You're going to deal with a lot of alcoholics, I'll tell you. <laughs> Dr. Bob Smith stood up at the first meeting of the Akron, uh, Oxford group meeting. And he said, I have a drinking problem. And they knew it. They all knew it. He didn't think they did, but they all did. And then they agreed, it was part of the Oxford Group thing, they agreed, each one of them agreed, that every morning they would get on their knees and pray to God to send help for Bob. And here's Henrietta, the top of Akron society, a lovely lady, with enormous wealth and all the rest of it. And her phone rings. And this voice on the other end of the phone, she has no idea, 
says, my name is Bill Wilson. I am a rummy from New York, and I have a way to fix drums. That's what he said to her. And she said, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you see, Henrietta is a woman of faith. Henrietta knew, like she knew her own name, that if she asked God to send help for Bob, God was going to send help for Bob. That's all there was to it. Henrietta said later, now her son was the congressman from uh, Akron, Ohio, might still be for all I know, and he he put all of this stuff in the congressional record when she died in the 70s. And uh, he called it my mother's involvement with AA. It's a very interesting thing if you ever see it. Anyhow, she said she wanted to look this guy over, make sure he wasn't an axe murderer or something. So she said, come on out. And he came out, and they talked for a while. She became convinced that he was okay. She said, where are you staying? He said, the Mayflower. Oh, you can't stay. She put him in the golf club, the Akron Golf Club. Set him right up. And then she called uh, Dr. Bob's house. She got Ann, Bob's wife. It's the Saturday of Mother's Day weekend. And uh, she says, I have the guy here to fix Bob. <laughs> because Ann was a member of the Oxford group, too. And she said to him, and... and Henrietta said to him, just like you say it's Tuesday, the guy's here to fix Bob. You know, you better bring Bob over and get him fixed. And Ann said, I'd love to, but he's passed out under the table. He brought home a potted plant. She said, he's more potted than the plant. And I have learned, she said, from long experience to let sleeping drunk sleep. But I'll have him out first thing in the morning. Now, you know first thing in the morning how Bob felt. And here's his wife. We're going out to Henrietta's. <laughs> There's a man out there who's going to fix you. <laughs> and Bob says, I will give that guy from New York. That's how they talk about Bill out in Akron to this day. That guy from New York. He said, I'll give that guy from New York 15 minutes. The meeting lasted five hours. And you remember that that uh, television thing they did? Bill W. was very effective thing with James Garner and uh, James Woods. You remember that? Very effective scene. And, and Woods is is Wilson and Garner is Smith, and and uh, they're meeting there and they're in 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 uh, Doctor in the any other study. And uh, Garner has that medical attitude, you know. He said, uh, "Just how do you think you're going to help me, Mister Wilson?" And Wilson said. I'm not here to help you. I'm here to help me, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and so they had this talk. Now, Bill, Bill told Bob all about what happened to him. And Bob said of Bill, he was the first one I had ever spoken to who spoke to me from personal experience about alcohol. It's easy. You all, we all had people talk down to us, and there was the doctors, the nurses, the bosses, the judges, the cops, the fact. It's but this when that sponsor got all of you and said, "I understand exactly what's going through your head, you miserable rotten bastard," you know. <laughs> and uh, he told him all of it, five hours. And Bob said, "I will do everything you say." This is terrific, Bob said. I'll do everything you say except one thing. I cannot make amends. This is a small town. I'm a physician. I'm on my last hospital affiliation. I'm broke. And the last thing in the world I can do is go around Akron, Ohio, and tell people I've been drunk for the last 25 years. You can't do it. So then they move Bill, moves into Bob's house. Bill says, I'll take what I got. And, and uh, he moves in. And then Bob gets one of those, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Did you ever have one of those thoughts? You know, what the hell am I doing here? It seemed like a good idea at the time. Are you the bridesmaid? That's right. <laughs> he announces, Bob does, that he's going to the American Medical Association convention in Atlantic City. Of course, his wife, you can't go there. You get drunk every time you go there. So I'm going. Bill says, not a good idea. He says, I'm going. So he went. He was drunk before he left Akron. And he got drunk, came back, <laughs> and, and his nurse's husband found him fighting in a bar, having a fight in a bar. Nice thing for a doctor, huh? The nurse's husband took him home, threw him on a couch, called up Bob's house and says, I got him. And Ann says, well, he's due at the hospital in the morning at a certain time, and uh, we'll come get him. Bill came out in Bob's car, 
brought three bottles of beer and some uh, Pino Bobs, roof balls they called them then. And I took Bob over to the city hospital, gave him the beer, gave him the goof balls, and uh, left him in the car, and Bob went up and worked on some guy's ass, and, uh, which is what he did, you know, for a living. And, and uh, now it's, you know, in Akron, Ohio, we eat dinner at 5 o'clock. And now it's 5 o'clock, it's dinner time, and there's no Bob, so you know he's drunk. And now it's 7 o'clock, and, and you know he's drunk. And now it's nine o'clock. He's really done it this time. He shows up at midnight and he's dry. Never had a drink. And of course, the first question that came from Bill, where you been? He said, I've been driving around Akron, Ohio, mending fences. It's an old Vermont expression. He was making those amends the very first day that he stopped drinking. You see what Bob did, he said to Bill, I'll take your program, except for one thing. He said, I will be sober, but I will not make amends. He wanted conditional sobriety. I won't do all the steps, I'll do some of the steps. It's not possible in our program to have that kind of sobriety. And the book is a book of experience, and the book they wrote had some of these steps we bought. Correct? We thought we could find an easier, softer way. That's what Bob thought. Bob thought there was an easier, softer way. But the results were nil until we let go and let go absolutely. There is no such thing as conditional sobriety. The book says wife or no wife, job or no job. Let no man say, don't let him say it, that he will only become sober if his family comes back. Because we've had the families come back and the guy did not stay sober. And we've had the families never come back and the guy stay sober for the rest of his life. Don't let him say it, that he will do everything except he can't make amends. Because he's different, he's a doctor. Because he's special, he's a doctor. Nobody is special. Now, and then, of course, you know what happened. From then on, when now we're in Akron, Ohio, and uh, they get filled the next day, and, and uh, so forth and so on. And here we are in 1997 in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I'll tell you this. That's a long, long way from Akron, Ohio. And I'm not talking about geography. That's a long way from Akron, Ohio. Had a lot of lives since Akron, Ohio. A lot of years since Akron, Ohio. And here we are, you and I. Now, I submit to you that none of this is coincidental. I submit that. It's not a coincidence. These people assembled the way they did before the big war, the first war. They were a cast of characters in a morality play, the author of which was this power that we talk about all the time. And they all had roles to play. And they didn't even know that they had roles to play. They had no idea what they were doing. If you had said to them in 1915, you're going to be all be the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> what? You know? <laughs> We're just kids having a good time here. We're just trying to, you know, trying to do things that kids try to do. We don't want to be founders of anything. They might want to play tennis or golf, you know. That was... Now, I submit all that to you. And I think uh, it's a great story. And I think it's nothing less uh, than a miracle. And then I, I get to my, my assignment. I was assigned this assignment. And that is to talk to you about our primary purpose. And I'm happy to do so. And I start, everything I, I start about is uh, I start talking uh, usually about the book. And in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that's this book here, the blue book. This is Sammy's book. And when you come in, you read the black part. See over here, the black part. You read that part there. Don't go reading this white part. 
because if you do, you will go blind. And some of you are going blind from the other things, so we don't want you to go twice blind here. Yeah? And then this book was published in 1938, 39, and for the first time, uh, the 12 steps appeared. For the first time, and uh, they're in the same form they're in now, they were in different forms, it was back and forth. And then in the second edition, they added the 12 traditions. And they're back in, in the back of the book, 565, in the appendices. Now, here is the problem. The one thing about which there must be unanimous opinion throughout the world is that Alcoholics Anonymous works. About that, there is no doubt and really has never been any doubt. Alcoholics Anonymous works for alcoholics. That we all know about. When I came to Alcoholics in 1965, alcoholism, I'm speaking generally now, was not covered by insurance. Hospitals would not accept a patient, a general hospital, hospital would not accept a patient under the diagnosis of alcoholic. Alcoholics had to go in under some other diagnosis, gastritis, enteritis, colitis, you know, all the itises, uh, they had to be disguised, and then they could dry out, to, you know, under being treated for colitis or something. And the insurance didn't cover it. Now, there have always been places where alcoholics could go, farms, sanitariums. Uh, there's one place in Connecticut that comes to mind, beautiful, nine holes of golf. It's really, it's been there forever. It's for rich people who, who drink too much. But the insurance didn't cover that because under the definition of a policy, insurance policy, under the definition of hospitals, they said a hospital is a place that has operating rooms and nurses and, and uh, delivery, or, you know, obstetricians and specialities, medical specialities. And none of these places had that, so they never qualified. So the only people who really had the benefit of professional care when it came to alcoholism were the rich who could afford to go to these farms. And we also know that uh, detoxification from uh, alcohol poisoning is what it is, is a very, very serious matter, and you can die from it much more so than from the other drugs. Well, in any event, that all began to change in the early 70s, and pretty soon uh, alcoholism was covered by insurance policies, and pretty soon a whole a whole uh, industry grew up of uh, taking care of alcoholics, all covered, all covered by insurance. And the earliest uh, insurance policies all covered 28 days. That was the Blue Cross standard, 28 days. It was seven weeks, uh, four weeks in hospital, 28 days. So the alcoholics got 28 days. And uh, so all of these 28-day programs grew up around the country and... Uh, and uh, you know, and I know, it's nice to get an alcoholic, get them a rest for 28 days, get them off the cycle, get them a while they could detox them in maybe 10 days. And in the early days, they didn't know what to do. Well, they, they grew up around this industry, and I'm not knocking industry, American capitalism, I'm all for it. Uh, they grew up, they had to grow up with, coextensive with it, a group of people who were going to service the industry. And so therefore, uh, we grew into having alcoholism counselors, uh, which grew into a separate disease. <laughs> and, and there had to be some regulation of these people, so the various states got into licensing these people, and and so these things all grew up together. And then you have a very thriving industry uh, run by alcoholic counselors who say they are in the field, is the expression they use, they're in the field. And it's only recently now that the cycle is going down. The uh, Most of the major insurance companies now will give you a detox, maybe four days, five days detox, and then the rest is what they call outpatient. You go find an alcoholism counselor in Miami now, they're all in storefronts, you know. Well, once the insurance attached, then they're, they're put in something that we call money. Now, the one thing we all know in our history and our traditions, and ever since Mr. Rockefeller was so smart, he said money is no good for 
people like this. No, no money. Don't give any money. But alcoholics should not have money. And uh, we're, we're doomed to communal poverty. Uh, except for us lawyers who are an exception to the rule. And deservedly so, Ralph, don't you think? And so, uh, as long as the insurance covered it, pretty soon a lot of people began showing up at alcoholism rehabilitation centers who were not alcoholics. But they were here, they were not alcoholics, but they were in this alcoholism rehabilitation center because they were covered by insurance. And the alcohol rehabilitation center, normally speaking, only has the one van. <laughs> so they can't be driving them all over town to various meetings. And they know AA works, so they would take them to the AA meeting. And we're so dopey that we let them in. Because we're full of love <laughs> and tolerance. That's our code. <laughs> and every once in a while there'd be some hard ass like me who would say to one of these gentlemen, What do you what do you want here? And they say, Well, I'm an addict. I know, but you're not what do you want here? This is not for addicts, no way. But that's people like me were fairly rare. And what I'd be they would tell them at the hospital. Tell them when you get there, tell make sure you tell me you're an alcoholic. Because especially if you go to his group, because if you don't tell him an alcoholic, he'll, he'll throw you out. So make sure you tell me you're an alcoholic. So they'd all show up and they alcohol then they talk fast, they say, Alcoholic addict. It's like a hyphen. I'm an alcoholic addict. Or I'm an addict alcoholic. And then we got all the anders came by. They really should say I'm an alcoholic and a and Right? And a and a. And if you cause a fuss, they say the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Correct? And they take that third tradition and stick it up your noodle. Now I'm going to read to you the third tradition in the long form, and we'll start that way. You ready? Our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought AA membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. Now, I submit to you that the third tradition limits Alcoholics Anonymous to alcoholics. The name of the book would give you a clue. <laughs> the fifth tradition... No, that's not right. Where's the other tradition? Yes. The first tradition, I thought that's right. Each alcoholic anonymous group ought to be a spiritual entity and love and tolerance. I'm talking about love and tolerance. Having but one primary purpose. And that phrase, but one primary purpose, is italicized. It's underlined here. Okay? That of carrying its message to the alcoholic who still suffer. I do not have a message for our non-alcoholics because I don't have any non-alcoholic experience. How would I bring a message to a non-alcoholic when I don't know anything about non-alcohol? My experience is of an alcoholic and that's what we share here. And I'm not putting anybody down and I'm not, uh, you know, remonstrating with anybody and I'm not saying I'm better or worse than anybody else. I am telling you what is an absolute truth. Alcoholics Anonymous is for alcoholics. What in the name of God is so complicated about that? Is that complicated? Narcotics Anonymous is for narcotics. Overeating Anonymous is for overeating. Time Magazine 
if you credit Tom Hanks or anything. Some years ago, I wrote a story, as you know, they usually do. Newsweek just had one about alcohol. It pops up every few years or so. And uh, Time Magazine said there were 500 <laughs> organizations that ended in anonymous. Can you conceive of that? 500. Including former owners of Edsel's. <laughs> whose lives turned to shit when they bought Edsel's. <laughs> People who hate their brothers-in-law. It was amazing, the stuff they had there. And they all traced it back, of course, to our town. There's an 800 number. There's an 800 number. You call in Manhattan, New York City. You, you call the 800 number. You tell them your problem, they tell you where to go. You say, I'm sticking bananas up my ass. <laughs> and I cannot stop. <laughs> and they say, Church of the Heavenly Rest, 2 o'clock. <laughs> Bring your own banana. <laughs> for every everything they got a thing. For everything they got a thing. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely unlimited. It's absolutely unlimited. Now, our 12th step of our program is like all of the stuff in our program, very, very simple. It says we, we try, you and I, carry this message. And the message of alcohol Anonymous is not stop drinking. That's not the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The message of Alcoholics Anonymous is you will be able to relate yourself once again to God. When Alcoholics Anonymous was 25 years old, the grapevine recently reprinted the correspondence between Bill Wilson and the great Carl Jung. And Bill Wilson wrote Carl Jung in 1960 on our 25th anniversary, he said, Dr. Young, we of Alcoholics Anonymous consider you to be a founder because of your advice to Roland Hazard, that led to Abby Thatcher, that led to Bill Wilson, that led to Bob Smith, and so forth. He got back a very nice letter from uh, Dr. Young. And Dr. Young said, I remember Roland Hazard. said his problem was that he had separated himself from the whole, W-H-O-L-E, in medieval language, from a union with God. Huh? Dr. Young knew that Roland Hazard's problem was not that he drank like a pig. That's just how the problem manifested itself. Dr. Young knew and that role it has is spirit was the thing that was affected. And Dr. Young even made a joke in Latin. And to show you, I'm erudite. He said, spiritus contra spiritum. You see, in Latin, the same word for spirit is the word for alcohol. Spirit, you know, wine and spirit. Spiritus, he says, spirits against spirit. And that's what alcoholism is. It comes and it takes our spirit away. Jack London, an alcoholic suicide at age 40, wrote to his friend Jack Barrymore and he said, Jack, last night the creature came and he took my heart away. This is a disease of the spirit and of the soul. And if we don't take care of ourselves and our spirits and our souls here, we will be in big trouble. And that's the whole point of this primary purpose. And that's the whole point of the announcements they make about singleness of purpose. It isn't that we're trying to exclude anybody. Our book says we are never to be exclusive. We are to be all inclusive. But it's all inclusive with respect to alcoholics. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But I think you should know these things if you have to deal with these people who insist on trying to use our own traditions against us. When someone tells you that all I need is a, is a desire to stop drinking, no, no, no. No, no. You need to be an alcoholic. And that is someone who is powerless over alcohol. And you can have all the desires you want. 
and you won't be able to stop drinking. Because the one thing about alcoholics is they can't stop drinking. Correct? You could do anything else, you'd probably fly to the moon. But you had absolutely nothing to face that booze with. And somebody said, you know, somebody said to me recently, what was your favorite kind of booze? I said, more. <laughs> said, why I said more? I said, why, why, why will you have to drink? More. Just, you know, give it. Anyhow, the message is this message. The message of young to Roland has it. Find a spiritual experience. The message of so course to Bill Wilson. Don't tell them. Tell them they're going to die. Try to get them, uh, pay their attention. Their soul, their spirit is in jeopardy. This is the message of alcoholics. And we're not a religion. In fact, God, we're not saints. We are not saints. And God for that, I'd be out of here very soon. What would we do with a saint if he showed up here? Where you want, where are you going to put him? Uh, don't put him next to me. Excuse me. Right? Hello. What's your name? I'm Frank. I'm from a city. Get out of here. <laughs> Make me feel bad just looking at you. Jesus. When somebody walks in and says, I'm Charlie and I'm an alcoholic, I know a great deal about him. Right then and there. He's a rotten, dirty, no good, lying, cheating son of a bitch <laughs> who stole money from his parents, his brothers, his sisters, his neighbors. He's no goddamn good. My kind of a guy. <laughs> and that's what the step says. Now, in 1950, this is to show you this is not a new problem we're dealing with. This is not a new problem. It's not very little things is new. Here we go. 1958. I've been an alcoholic. I've been through. I was here. I was here when Jesus came by. In the 60s, he came by. People coming to meetings reading Bible. They wanted to rap about Jesus. I was here when the hyperglycemic epidemic struck. Everybody was hyperglycemic. They're all walking around having sugar, glucose, tolerance tests, you know, they're eating a little, little meal. The ladies liked it. They all lost weight. You know, they're running around eating trail mix or something, you know. God. And then the victims all showed up, the 80s, and the victims all came in. Oh, they're all from dysfunctional families. Huh? Does anybody know what a functional family is? They're all from dysfunctional. They were probably the cause of the dysfunction in their family. I just found out about four years ago that I'm from a dysfunctional family. I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. I had no father and an alcoholic mother. Very dysfunctional. Well, we had breakfast at 7 and dinner at 6. Worked all right for me. So anyhow, and I'm digressing. In 1958, Bill Wilson, Bill Wilson in 1958 wrote an article for the grapevine because the non-alcoholics were beginning to show up in great numbers. I was here when the pills began to come through. You know, you have to understand that prior to the 1960s, there was no such thing as psychotropic medicine. Before the 1960s, there was no Valium. There was no Librium. There was no anything. There was uh, phenobarbital. You know, sedation, stuff like that. But all of those those other uh, pharmaceuticals, the psychotropic pharmaceuticals, were not there. They just didn't exist. And all of a sudden they came. And I remember uh, Milltown was the first one. And uh, I got a bottle of that. I was, you know, I'm drunk all the time in the 60s, and uh, I'm really reaching my peak. I'm around the 63. I'm really at the top of my form. That was the first time I came to AA, and, and my wife, she who must be obeyed, uh, made me go to this doctor, and he gave me a, a bottle of milk ham. And he said, when you feel like drinking, have one of these. Well, I felt like drinking day and night, so I was having a lot of milk ham. And I felt pretty good. And I, I felt so good that I walked into a saloon, and uh, I said to this jerk that I used to know and drink with, Look at that. I got that stuff. Milltown. He said, yeah. Throw it right in the middle of a martini. He said, we call it a miltini. <laughs> it will knock you on your ass. I said, it will? He said, yeah. Boom. Boom. <laughs> and it did. And it did. 
and that was the end of my involvement with psychotropic drugs. <laughs> so anyhow, here's Bill now, and and you know, and here's the sixties, and the the values he's still in up, and they taught like this. You know, the mouth is very dry, and they say, they said, what the hell is the matter with Nothing's the matter with me. <laughs> well, you can't can't smell anything, you know, but he's acting like a fool. He's falling asleep in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, that kind of stuff. And he said, well, you take it to just let the doctor describe you. Know. Say, where is he? He's got it in every pocket. He's got his hat, you know. Oh, oh, Jesus. And the question is, what do you do with these people? As you know, there's no difference. There's no difference in principle between... Valium eaters, cocaine users, heroin users, gay overeating cross dressers. <laughs> What's the difference? Tell me the difference. Here's Bill. Now, we wouldn't characterize Bill as a, a, a hard ass, would we? <laughs> says sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps is the sole purpose of an AA group. Groups have repeatedly tried other activities and they have always failed. It has also been learned that there is no possible way to make non-alcoholics into AA members. See? Now, in case you had trouble with that, <laughs> absorbing that, we printed that. We printed this, which is this light. <laughs> and in this, we repeat, and we put it in color. I see no way of making non-alcoholics into AA members. Experience says we can admit no exceptions, even though drug users and alcoholics happen to be cousins of a sort. If we persist in trying this, we'll be hard on the drug user himself. He's in the wrong place. You understand? He's in the wrong place. As well as on AA, we must accept the fact that no non-alcoholic, whatever his affliction, can be converted into an alcoholic and an AA member. You understand? Now, that's not being hard ass. That's the, the core of this fellowship. Non-alcoholics do not belong in AA. That's that. Now, they have these questions. Can a non-alcoholic pill or drug addict become an AA member? No. Can such a person be brought as a visitor to an open AA meeting for help and inspiration? Of course, of course, of course. If so, should these non-alcoholic pill or drug users be led to believe they have become AA members? Can a pill or drug taker who has a genuine alcoholic history become a member of AA? That's the Anders. That's the Anders. They're alcoholics. They have an ego problem, like a lot of alcoholics do. Here's the way this one goes. You're an alcoholic? Yeah. Well, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. I raise you one. What do you, what do you think of that, you poor rummy? You know, and then, or they may have a couple. Gay, I'm a gay, overeating, cross-dressing, alcoholic, drug addict. <laughs> My God, you know. <laughs> Boggles the mind. This is the ego problem. They want, first of all, in violation of everything we hold dear, they want to be different. You understand? The whole core of, of you and I being together is that we are the same. Correct? We are we. Correct? We are we. Without we being we, we don't have the first step, we don't have anything. We are we. They are not we. They want to be recognized as somebody different, who have suffered in some peculiar way that poor Rummy me could never possibly understand. You're an alcoholic, you poor thing. Well, listen to this. I'm also, and then they list out what they, who gives a shit? <laughs> and besides, they're saying the same thing twice, are they not? See, the treatment centers uh, are really the villains in this piece. And uh, 
Go ahead, keep talking. And I don't like to beat on the treatment centers because they're practically out of business. Practically. I mean, some of them have got such deep pockets that they'll, they'll last for another 10 years, but the rinky dink ones are gone and the big ones are still hanging around, you know. But, uh, in the treatment centers, uh, they, they promote the big lie in this area, the big lie. And it's a matter of principle. Here's the big lie. The big lie is this. One addiction is the same as another. That is a big lie. That is not the same medically. It is not the same chemically. And it certainly is not the same in recovery. You go out to that street over there and go to the supermarket and bring me back a hundred people. Any hundred. Put them in this room. Give me an unlimited supply of cocaine. Put it right over there. Come back in a month. I will give you 100 cocaine addicts. Every one of them will do anything I ask them to do to get their hands on this stuff. You understand? Go get me another 100. Bring them over here. Give me an unlimited supply of whiskey. Pile it up over there. Come back in a month. I might have 12 alcoholics for you. Eight, twelve, something like that. Because alcohol does not cause alcoholism. Cocaine causes cocaine addiction. You understand? It's a physical addiction. Alcoholism starts with a physical addiction, but it's nothing like a physical addiction. If alcoholism was just a physical addiction, we'd have one step. You and I, correct? Come to the meeting. What should I do? Stop drinking, moron. <laughs> oh, is that it? Yeah, see up there, step one, the big step. Don't drink. You here again? This is your second week here. You see that big first step? Don't drink some more. Eh? Don't drink. That would be the thing. But it's not alcohol is is alcoholism is not caused by alcohol. Alcoholism is caused by a separation from God. When this happened to me, I don't know. I know it happened, but I, I can't tell you when, I suppose. I'm not even quite sure I was ever connected. I'm not religious. I was not religious then. I'm not religious now. I've never been religious. But I have a, uh, and my name is O'Keefe. I have a, a Catholic education. I'm a graduate of a Jesuit university. I've never been religious. It never interested. It just it never got my attention. It didn't bother me. I'm very, very smart. It just didn't interest me. I thought, that's nice, you know. It's, I was interested in basic things, trying to get laid and uh, get a job, stuff like that, find some money so I could get laid. <laughs> and then I got to be a roué alcoholic and I became sort of a man of the world, you know. I went in 5,000 bars. I got laid twice. You know? uh, but I digress. You see, this, this, uh, let me tell you about Dr. Jelinek. Let me tell you about Dr. Jelinek. Dr. Jelinek, Back in the 30s and 40s, Dr. Jelinek ran the Yale University School of Alcoholism Studies. See, we've been looking at this thing for a long time. It's now at Rutgers University. They moved it. But Jelinek, and Jelinek ran this thing. It was connected with Yale. It was part of Yale, quite a place. And he developed, you've seen the Jelinek curve about tolerance going up like that and a jump and falls off like you fall off a cliff. That's the Jelinek curve. And in some circles, alcoholism was called Jelinek's disease. So the great Jelinek, scientist that he was, said to a couple of his assistants one day, these people are so baffling. They do such wild things. You know, our book says not only are we insane, but we are strangely insane. <laughs> and uh, this guy, Jelinek, was confirming all of that. You know, it's it, our book says, the problem centers in the mind. Wouldn't you think a book says the, the problem centers in the alcohol? The problem centers in the fact these people drink impossible amounts of alcohol? The problem centers in the mind. And Jelinek says, the only way I can figure this one out is I'm going to become an alcoholic. He's a real scientist. He says, I will become an alcoholic. And then I'll understand. So he said, bring out some booze. So they went and they got him some booze. He got through about a half a bottle of bourbon. 
and he was sitting in a chair, and he fell out of the chair. And he hit his head on the corner of the desk as he went out. And he hit the floor and cracked in his pants and passed out. And three hours later, he came to. You know the first thing he said was, I will never, ever drink anything like that again as long as I live. Now, that's not us. <laughs> You're there at 7 in the morning banging on the door of that bar. Open up this dump. You got anything left? You know that stuff that took away my driving license, my license to be a lawyer, my marriage license, my house, my money, my family, my children, my self-respect, my esteem, my spirit? You got anything left? Give it to me. What's the price? Here. What do you want? Here's my house. Here's my car. Here's my children. Give me that shit. Is that the same shit that knocked you out of the chair, hit you in the head? And I, I love that crap. Give me more. Did you ever say, I'll never drink that again as long as I live? That stuff is crap. That makes you crazy. Uh, sure it does. That's why we drink it. That's what Silkway said. He said, people don't, alcoholics don't drink because it tastes good. If it tastes good. Go have an ice cream soda for Christ's sake. Leave me alone. Said men and women drink essentially for the effect it has on them. I have a brother-in-law, Louis. Louis is a lawyer. He's a graduate of the Harvard Law School. You say to Louis, would you like another drink, Louis? You know what he says? No, thank you. I'm beginning to feel it. <laughs> you want to get him right by the neck. And say, that's what it's for, Louis. That's why we drink it, because we feel it, you dumb bat. <laughs> And he's just beginning to feel, no, no, no. <laughs> Harvard Law School, they don't want to lose control of the world. You know? Now, all of this has to do with what we're doing here. What is our message and for whom is our message? And it isn't that, uh, again, we're not, I'm not trying to exclude anybody. If someone tells me they have a, a serious heroin problem, I have great empathy for that. I really do. I, I do a great deal of work with uh, lawyers uh, throughout the country. And uh, as a matter of fact, I am the number one drunken lawyer in the United States of America. And this, I am chairman of the board of the lawyers in AA, international lawyers in AA. And we have lots, especially where I live in Miami, lawyers with cocaine problems. And I have great empathy for that. And I try, you know, to find somebody they can work, talk to. Ralph and I were talking about it once. I get them somebody who, who's had a cocaine problem. I'm not going to talk to them about their cocaine problem. I never had any cocaine. Not that I did. I wouldn't have. Nobody gave me any. That's all. <laughs> it wasn't available. I would have, I would I could become addicted to raisins, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and so I'm not, I'm not putting this that Alcoholics Anonymous is for alcoholics. And it is no good that they try to use our, our uh, traditions against us. And I'll tell you something else. AA is like a great self-cleaning oven. And every few years or so, it clicks on to clean. And it burns out all the crap. And these people disappear. I'll tell you, you know why they disappear? Because they're not stupid. You just think I get enough experience. They don't stay very long. Oh, they make a lot of noise in my experience. Well, they, they don't stay a long time. Because it's not for them. They don't need a spiritual awakening. I'm not putting them down. They don't need a spiritual awakening. They need to stop using the drug they're using. That's what they need. If an alcoholic stops using alcohol, you know what happens? He kills himself. You understand me? An alcoholic who stops using alcohol and doesn't have a sufficient substitute kills himself. Meninger, probably the America's greatest psychiatrist, Meninger, the seminal work on psychiatry, has the alcoholic in his chapter on suicide. And he says of us, and Sukhoi says it in a different way, Manager says of us, I'm alcoholic. The alcohol is the glue that holds them together. And you take out that alcohol, these people fall apart. They blow up in a thousand 
There's a great doctor in Louisville. I don't know if you ever heard of him. A great, he's a great a man, a great doctor, good speaker, and a very, very smart guy. And I was asking him. I'm always trying to find out about this stuff, and I was asking him about it. And listen to what he said. This is terrific. And this is a physician. He says, alcohols are born not feeling good. They don't, they're not sick. They don't have to be put anywhere. They don't need any medicine. They just don't feel good. It's a hassle. It's a hassle. They're in the wrong bunch, the wrong family. Their brother gets all the good stuff. And they get crap for Christmas. And uh, nobody likes them. And schools are paying the ass. And uh, people are yelling at them all the time. And they don't feel good. They just don't feel good. This sounds like it's familiar to you. And then when they're about 13... Maybe 12, 13. Somebody says, here, try some of this. So they try it. And they go, ooh. <laughs> and then they say, uh, I'll have another one of those. And they drink that and they go, oh, hmm. Then they have another one. And they say, well, my mother's not so bad. Uh, I feel all right. That school is okay. I'll go there tomorrow. And, uh, look, I'm getting taller. <laughs> and, uh, I don't to go over and talk to that girl over there. She's a wait for me to go over and talk to her. Hi, kid, you know. And, and he thinks to himself, Jesus, I feel good. Now, isn't that sort of a euphemism for being drunk? He's feeling good. Correct? I think there's a lot to that. A lot to that explanation. We don't feel good. We just don't feel good. And it's the alcohol that lets us feel good. And so he says we drink for the effect of it, and there's an effect that's illusory. It's out there somewhere. And you all remember, you all remember when you learned to drink? And that wonderful feeling good, you know, and when you, you learned, you had to learn. You had to stop that bed from, you had to put your foot on the floor. You learned to stop the bed from going like that, yeah. And you drank your way through it. You learned how to puke like it was an art form. <laughs> and then you got through that phase of it, and pretty soon you had this astounding tolerance. And you're driving all your friends home and all that stuff, and you feel good. Okay? The trouble is, we're dealing with a narcotic substance, and so the more you take, the less you get, and pretty soon you're taking them the three quarts to try to capture that first can of beer, and you're not catching up to it. You're not catching up to it, and it's killing you. But you see, if you take the alcohol out of the alcoholic, without, as our book says, do you have a sufficient substitute? That's what the book says. And it's a very simple proposition. Once again, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I need to hear this as much as you do with it. Here's what our book says. And our book says, what I think is all I need to know is what our book says. It says, God is or he isn't. What is your answer to be? Now, religion says, God is, and he's a 34-year-old Jewish gentleman who died, unfortunately, on a Friday, but he came back on Sunday, and everything's fine ever since. And that's what your idea is. We don't say that. We said he is or he isn't. What is your answer to be? What is your answer to be? Huh? Now, you want to you wanna be right, or you want to be sober? You want to be smart, like me, and bright, like me, or you want to be sober? You want to show off, or you want to be so. That's why I had that sponsor. He was terrible to me. He would say that to me. You want to, you want to be smart, or you want to be sober, O'Keefe? Oh, you're very bright. You're very clever. Now, do you want to be sober? I say, I don't feel so good. You say, this may be as good as you'll ever feel. <laughs> I, I said, Jesus, I'm nervous. What do you think I should do? He said, hold on. I said, well, how do you hold on? He said, let go. 
<laughs> and then I would whine. You know, I was no different than anybody else. I would whine. Oh, as I was as I whine. I said, when will I get a good job? I had lost a wonderful job. I was a university professor. I lost that job. So when will I get a good job? He said, yeah, when you're ready. Oh, Jesus. I said, well, how do I know I'm ready? He said, you'll have a good job. <laughs> so I thought I, I thought I explained that to you. And that's why we have a sponsor. That's why we have a sponsor. The edition now, this is the, Sammy, this is the second edition, is it? Mark, that third? Good. Then in the third edition, so beat up, it looks like a first edition. In the third edition, when they talk about the forward to the third edition, it's on XXIII. Can't be humor there, Roman numerals. <laughs> How's about this? Recovery begins when insurance runs out. <laughs> Here's what it says in the preface to the third edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Each day, somewhere in the world, recovery begins. It begins. It doesn't seem ever to end. Recovery begins when one alcoholic talks with another, sharing experience, strength, and hope. Correct? It is the experience that brings us the strength. My experience as an alcoholic brings me the strength. It is the strength that brings us the hope. It's the experience and the strength and the hope. And hope is where it begins. See, hope is the younger sister of faith. Faith is belief. Faith is, is what religious people have. They believe. And sometimes, and most times, they believe things that are almost unbelievable. You know, you think of Christmas and Easter and all this stuff. Unbelievable stuff. They believe it. They believe it. And uh, hope is less than that. But here we have a faith, I have a faith at least based on my experience. And you ought to have a faith based on your experience. No one knows better than you, do they? What brought you here? Is there anybody in the world who knows better than you why you're here? You know. And we can cover it over. Our book says we do that. We, it says deep down, deep down in every man, woman, and child, it says there is a basic idea of God. Oh, it says we covered it over. I did. We covered it over with pomp. Big old, big old kid. Or calamity. The young child dies. But deep down it's there, it says. We found it deep down in ourselves, it says. And the book goes on and says, and it says things in such a wonderful, unstated, understated way. It says, it was so with us. It was so with them. Now God is or he isn't. And he's in you or he isn't. And he's in me or he isn't. And because he is, we are. And that's how simple it is. Oh, you can argue with it all you want. You can debate it from now till the sun comes home. We never seem to tire talking to it. At least I don't. But the truth is basically the, the truth. And it says in our book, the great fact is this. We have all had vital spiritual experiences. That's the great fact for us. We've had vital spiritual experiences. Not that we stop thinking. Listen, over the course of years, over the course of history, everywhere and every civilization and every time somebody has stopped drinking, we all know people who, who used to drink and don't drink and they don't go to any stop. And they're alcoholics too, some of them. They just put it down. That's the way they are. 
Our books has the one guy did it for 25 years, and then he retired, and boom, he was back at it and back and forth. You see, the reason we have June 10th as our birthday is that's the day that Dr. Bob stopped drinking. Now, up to that time, up to June 10th, 1935, there had always been somebody in the world who didn't drink. That's been going on for a long time. But on June the 10th, 1935, there were two. And the second one was there because the first one shared his experience, strength, and hope with him. And that's why that's our birthday. Because there were two. Not one. The we had arrived. And my obligation, and I submit to you, your obligation, as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, is to preserve that we. We alcoholics. To preserve it. In your groups. And I have a suggestion on how you do that. I belong, and I tell you my experience, I belong to a group and I belong to, uh, up to 1984, I lived in New York and I was in one group for 20 years or 19 years and then I've been in the same group since I moved to Florida in 84, which is another 13 years. And the group I belong to in New York and the group I belong to in Florida is all the same. We have two meetings a week. We have a big book meeting on Monday and we have the step meeting on Thursday. On Monday, we read the big book for 15 minutes and we go around the room. On Thursday, we have the guy lead the step meeting and we go around the room. We do not have any discussion on coping, the inner child, the outer child, the half in and half outer child. <laughs> we don't discuss resentment, anger. We have no topic needs. We do not allow reminiscence of drunken escapades. We say this is a big book meeting. Read along with the reader can find your comments to the material read. We say this is a step meeting. Listen to the leader. Can find your materials to the materials discussed by the leader. Now, plenty of non-alcoholics come to my group. We're a very popular group down there. We're a big group. We have maybe 75 members. That's a big group. And the non-alcoholics come and they don't stay. Now, we don't have to throw them out. They get bored. So I'd like to tell you what happened to me today. Ah, take that out into the parking lot. That's what we tell them. That's a parking lot subject. <laughs> say what? Out in the parking lot. Somebody might listen to you. In here, we don't give a shit. <laughs> Whether you had a good day or a bad day or some other day, you know. What we want to know is, did you write an inventory? Did you discuss it with your sponsor? Did you admit it to God? Did you admit it to yourself? What happened to you after you did that? We'll listen to that. You understand? Now, these people are not dumb. They know that. This is not for them. They want to go where they can talk about, you know, how they scored and how they do this and how they do that. Which is what I would have loved to have done, but I had that sponsor. See? And the reason that we need very, very strong sponsors is because of this breakdown in the hospital. This breakdown in the treatment centers is going to require you and I to be real sponsors. You know, throwing somebody in a car and taking him over to Happy Dale and parking him for a month, that's not 12-step work. A taxi cab do that better than you could do it. Recovery begins when one alcoholic sits down with another alcoholic and shares his experience, his strength, and his hope. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed since Bill went into that uh, Henrietta study and talked to Bob. Now, the span has exchanged, the personnel have, have changed, the breadth, the numbers are incredible. Yeah. It says in the first edition, you know, you may meet, you may meet some of us as you go around and all that stuff. God, you can't go anywhere now. Without running down whole times, they have it in, in uh, you know, if you go to the international conventions. Do you remember that? And I remember in Seattle when the, the Russian flag came in and the Czechoslovakian and all the Slovak nations came in and they all came in. 
and up to the one before that, which was in, I forget, uh, then when they, they weren't there. And now it says 190 Montreal, 194 countries, is that where it is? I think we're up to 3 million members, but they're very conservative in how they estimate. And we have to be very careful because Alan runs in Virginia Beach. <laughs> And if we make any misstatements, it'll get reported into headquarters. <laughs> now, I brought this thing along, and it's over there. And it's a letter. A guy named Jack up in New York wrote me and asked me what I, I uh, thought we could do about it. And I'm looking here to see if there's anything I left out from what I've been talking about for the last hour and a half. Uh, I talk about the people who come now, I call them grateful, recovering cross-addicted, chemically dependent, substance-abusing, alcoholics and addicts. Uh, that's about right. And I'm not here to knock them or anything else, but there is something spiritual, I suppose, which limits the effectiveness of alcoholics and anonymous to alcoholics. And about that, there should be no argument or even discussion. Why this is so, I haven't the slightest idea. Why it should not work for other people, I don't know. I know that it does not work in the same way it works for me. I know people who come to my group who are uh, addicted to other drugs. Some of them stop using other drugs, and some for long periods of time, too. And their lives are much better. But they do not get what I claim to, to have got, and that is not... Uh, I haven't gotten any taller since I came around. I certainly haven't gotten any thinner since I came around here. But what has happened to me is I have enjoyed a spiritual awakening. I have uh, had my, my spirit come awake. It wasn't ever that I was so evil. I thought I was something of, of a roué and a man of the world and all the rest of it, but uh, the truth of it, I was just another alcoholic, pathetic, powerless alcoholic who had lost the manageability of my life. I couldn't manage my life. It was too much for me. Without help, it was just too much for me. And I, I say, and I, I say, it literally through the grace of God. I was able to uh, enjoy this awakening of my spirit. And I know that sometimes it's difficult to carry this message, and this is the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the message the 12 says, says having had a spiritual awakening as the result, that's the only result. I didn't get any taller, I didn't get any thinner, didn't. that's it. We carry this message. The message is the message of the spiritual awakening, the message to alcoholics. It says. Why would you carry this message to someone who's not an alcoholic? What are they going to do it? They're not going to have the spiritual awakening. They don't need it. They need to stop using the drug they're using. And if they stop using the drug they're using, they will not use it again. Alcoholics, if you put down that booze precipitously, you'll probably kill yourself. You'll jump out of a window. Because your problem never was the stuff in that bottle. Your problem is, our book says we have to concede. We have to learn to concede. It isn't something we know. We have to learn to concede to our innermost self. You understand? This marvelous form that I present to you, this is my outermost self here. This is not my innermost self. This in here, in there, is my innermost self. The problem is that it senses in the mind. The mind is not the brain. The brain is an organ. It sits up here on top of your head. It's like a little cap, like a little gelatin cap. Sits up here and up here and goes all the way back there, and it's got a split in the middle of it. It's got a left hemisphere, it's got a right hemisphere. That's a brain. The problem doesn't center in the brain. 
It centers in the mind. No one knows where the mind is. The mind is not subject to an x-ray. It's not subject to, you can operate on the brain. You can cut a hole in the scalp or through the brain, and they do it with suction. They go to piano lessons, zip, right out like that. <laughs> but to operate on the mind, they cannot operate on the mind because the mind is the medical equivalent of the soul. See? Spirit contra spiritus. The mind is the spirit. And its problem centers in the spirit. And what we have is a spiritual disease. And the only remedy for a spiritual disease is a spiritual awakening. And the only way I know to have a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps. Which is a subject beyond what I can ask to speak about. You and I are not what we see here. We all know that uh, this is not going to last. I have a number of medical problems, any one of which could kill me in a minute. And uh, I'll be 70 soon, and I expect to have things like that happen to me. So I know this it's held on all these years. But I have an opinion that this is not me. That there's something other than this. I don't know a thing about it, but I think there's something other than this. And it's there's something other than this that Alcoholics Anonymous has been treating for 32 years. It's been treating my spirit by giving a spiritual remedy. Spiritus contra spiritus. And I need that. Whatever I did. I need Alcoholics Anonymous more today than ever I did. I think. Because it's still can, it's still four o'clock in the morning sometimes. Yes? And sometimes that fear comes. Sometimes I say, what is that? Oh, yeah, you son of a bitch. You bastard fear. And I say, I offer myself these to do with me, to build with me, as you will. Fear goes away. Fear goes away. Well, this has been very nice. I'm one of those guys who goes around and, and uh, I talk a lot, as you know, on and on. And when I end, I usually end this way. And I'm going to end now. I don't think I can go any further. I'm going to start crying. I read the last page in a book, which is something I read every day. So it means a lot to me. Here it is. You may say, I will not have the benefit of contact with you who write this book. We cannot be sure. God will determine that. So you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do for the new man who suffers. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, obviously, you cannot transmit a message that you do not have. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and for countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and, and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you treasure the road of happy destiny. 
I usually end by talking of, of one of our pamphlets, which is uh, very dear to me, I think is our best pamphlet. And uh, it's called The Member's View of Alcoholics Anonymous. And on the very last page of that pamphlet, the author, he takes a biblical reference. And he recalls the time when John the Baptist was once again languishing in one of Herod's prisons. And John sent two of his friends to inquire of his cousin, Jesus, as to whether or not he was the Messiah. And these two men walked with the Lord, and, and they stopped him one day. And they said to him, Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for all such a long time, or should we wait for somebody else? And he, he didn't answer that question. But he said to these two men, go back to John and tell John only what you have seen and only what you have heard. Tell John that the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf can hear. Tell John that the sick are made well and that the poor have the gospel brought to them. In my early training, I was told that the word poor in that context could mean poor in spirit. And everybody knows the word gospel simply means good news. So, my dear, dear sisters and brothers, in happy assembly here at Virginia Beach, if you will accept a report from me I will tell you only what I have seen and only what I have heard. And based on that personal observation, it seems to me that the blind do see and the lame do walk. And I know, I know that the deaf can hear and most certainly almost certainly the sake of made well and I have seen over and over and over again through the longest day and into the darkest night the good news of this program brought to the alcoholic who suffers the poor in spirit God bless you Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.